Well, we're going to begin a short six-week study in the book of Psalms with Psalm 148. You can turn there. Uh, Psalms is right in the middle of your Bible. Shouldn't be too hard to find. I'll do one. John will do one. I'll do one. We'll repeat that a few times. And then at the end, we'll vote who's the better preacher. So, uh, all right. Psalm 148. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. And he established them forever and ever. He gave a decree and it shall not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures in all depths or deeps. Fire and hail, snow and mist, stormy wind fulfilling his word. Mountains and all his hills, fruit trees and all cedars. Beasts and all livestock, creeping things and flying birds. Kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and maidens together, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord. For his name alone is exalted, his majesty above earth and heaven. He has raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all his saints, for the people of Israel who are near to him. Praise the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, may we be moved to praise you for your names above all earthly things, all heavenly things, all things. In your son's name we pray. Amen. The book of Psalms closes with five hallelujah psalms. They're called hallelujah psalms because uh, 146 through 150 both begin and end with the phrase, praise the Lord, translated from the Hebrew, hallelujah. Neither the author nor the occasion for this psalm is known for sure. However, there's evidence that the occasion for both uh, Psalms 146 and 147 is a rebuilding of Jerusalem after the captivity and the dedication of the new temple. So many commentators think that is probably the initial purpose of all five of these psalms. If that's right, uh, there is certainly a thematic relevance. These psalms celebrate God's work of deliverance and dominion. God isn't content just to deliver us from sin. He continues to grow us in holiness. That's what theologians call sanctification, It's the work of God's free grace where we are renewed in the whole man after his image and are enabled more and more to die to sin and live to righteousness. You can think of it uh, as the work of an increasing dominion at a personal or individual level. God's rule is increasingly established in your life. Whereas Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3.18, as we behold Jesus, we are being transformed by the Spirit from glory to glory. This individual transformation has societal consequences because it affects all those around you. Again, Paul in 2 Corinthians says, but thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. As Christ leads you in triumphal procession, procession, excuse me, procession, as he leads you in victory over sin and increasing righteousness, the word of the gospel is displayed in and through your life. It says, through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. It's like a fragrance that fills a room, except the room is the world. It's everywhere. It's a smell you can't ignore. It's the smell of dominion. Paul continues, for we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing, to the one an aroma from death to death, to the other an aroma from life to life. It's through his work in our life that judgment is declared to those under sin's dominion, those moving from death to death. It's a warning, a call to repentance. It's through his work in our life that grace is declared to those under Christ's dominion, those moving from life to life. It's an encouragement, a call to continuing dependence on him who saved you. Dominion, as in the rule of God, is spread into the entire world through the gospel, being declared in word, and being displayed indeed in the lives of God's people. Doesn't that make you want to say, praise the Lord, hallelujah. Israel was delivered from its captivity, but they weren't left to wander. They weren't abandoned by God. They were brought back home 
and with the help of the Lord, were able to build a new temple. They saw God's continuing and increasing work in and through them, and that made them want to praise him. So that occasion, the dedication of the temple, makes a lot of sense to me. It fits the theme of these psalms, especially Psalm 148. The theme or message of Psalm 148 is easy to deduce. Everything and everyone, everywhere, should praise the Lord. The psalmist is calling on every single part of the universe to praise the Lord. First, in verses 1 through 6, he calls upon the heavens to all the things above the earth to praise the Lord. And then in 7 through 14, he calls everyone under the heavens who dwell upon the earth to praise the Lord. Within that latter group, there's a further subsection. In verse 12 through 14, he calls all the redeemed dwelling on earth to praise the Lord. In essence, the psalmist is a choir director assembling the largest choir of all time, all of creation. Their song is simple. It's a single chorus, praise the Lord. Their audience is the greatest audience, an audience of one, the Lord God Almighty. That's this psalm. Let's look at verse 1 through 6, which begins with praise the Lord. What does it mean to praise the Lord? If you look up the word praise, in a modern dictionary like the Oxford, you find this pathetic and anemic definition. To praise is to express warm approval or admiration of, right? That's like a lukewarm cup of coffee. It does nothing for me. If you go back to the original Webster's, you read this among the various definitions. To praise is to extol in words or song, to magnify, to glorify on account of perfections or excellent works. Right? That's getting closer to what it means in Scripture. All 13 occurrences of praise in Psalm 148 are from the same Hebrew word. The word praise has several senses in Hebrew, but at its core, it means to shine or boast. It means to call attention to something with shouts of acclamation. It's a lot like bragging. When we praise the Lord, we shine a light on his amazing perfections and works in creation. We spotlight all the great things about him. We boast of our God. We seek to make him famous. Fame is a public report of good or great actions. It's a report that exalts the character of an individual. Everyone praises someone. Everyone boasts in something. Jeremiah 9, the Lord says, Let not the wise man boast of his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast of his might. Let not a rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts boast of this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth, for I delight in these things, declares the Lord. Who or what do you praise? What is the thing that you boast of in this life? We were made to worship and praise. Praising is inevitable. It is in our nature by God's design, and not just us, but all of creation. Hence, the psalmist begins with the heavens. Look at verse 1 through 4. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens, and your waters above the heavens. It's fitting that he begins with things in the heavens, whether referring to the spiritual or heavenly realm or just the sky and outer space. Both are otherworldly to us and awe-inspiring. That's why we have such a tendency to praise or worship angels or things in the sky. In Revelation 22, very end of the book, John concludes the book with this. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed me these things. But he said to me, do not do that. I'm a fellow servant of yours and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who heed the words of this book. Worship God. Now think of that. John was an old man and an experienced pastor who suffered much for the gospel when he had written this book by this time. He had been with Jesus. He saw his miracles, his resurrected body, his ascension into heaven. And yet, in a moment of weakness, he bowed before angels. But the angel wouldn't allow it. 
he said, don't do that. I can hear the annoyance, almost the anger in his voice. I'm a servant like you. Worship God. We have the same tendency with the sun, the moon, and the stars. How many pagan religions worship those heavenly bodies? I used to watch the History Channel, so I would say to the mid-2000s, you could have called it the Hitler Channel, because it was all just about World War II, right? And I thought that was bad, but now it's just the Aliens Channel. (laughs) That's all it is. And it's always about weird stuff. But one thing that they always highlight when you watch those shows is just how much uh, the pagans' pyramids and temples and any sort of art that they created uh, is meant to align with the stars or the zodiac. It's built around worshiping the sky. You may think we, modern men, are beyond that. That is our modern pride, our tendency to look down on those who came before us, but we're not. We can't help but worship. And unredeemed worship takes only one form. It's always centered on the creation. You either worship the creator or you will worship the creation. There are no other paths. There's a famous atheist writer and astronomer named Carl Sagan, passed away a long, long ago, 1996, something like that. But he was very influential in the scientific and educational uh, community. I used to watch his show, uh, Cosmos, which was all about outer space. I read a bunch of his books. He was actually an influence in my life for atheism. So that was the guy that helped me justify rejecting God. Um, Though Sagan said he was an atheist, he still worshiped. And anyone that has ever watched Cosmos knows that. But listen to this quote. This is a very famous one. The cosmos is all that is or was or will ever be. Kind of sounds like I am the Alpha and Omega, right? Our feeblest contemplations of the cosmos stirs us. There's a tingling in the spine, a catch in the voice, a faint sensation as if a distant memory or falling from a height. We know we are approaching the greatest of mysteries. People are often elegant in their apostasy and heresy. And Sagan proves that you either have an eternal pre-existing creator or you deify the creation by making it eternal. That's it. Either stuff was forever or God created it. Those are your only choices. And if there is no God and stuff is forever, you make stuff into God. For Sagan, the cosmos was his God. You can hear it in his praising and boasting in its glories. And the cosmos is glorious. It is glorious. As are the angels and all the heavenly hosts. But they are only a slight and small fractional reflection of the glory of the Lord. The psalmist calls the angels in the heavens to worship, not because they don't. They already do. One of the beautiful things in Revelation is what the angels are doing. They're just around the throne of God, praising God. So why does he do this here? What's well, a reminder to us that they too are made to praise God, that they too are servants of God. We need that constant reminder. In verse 1, we have the call to praise. And then in verse 2 through 4, we have a seven-member heavenly choir assembled. And then in verses five and six, we have the cause for the praising of the Lord. Listen, let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created, and he established them forever and ever. He gave a decree, and it shall not pass away. God is so great that he made all things simply by commanding them into existence. By the word of his power, there was nothing And there was something because God spoke. The defining fact of all creation is that it was made by the creator for a purpose. He established creation for a purpose. He decreed that it would exist for his glory. Psalm 111, 2 says, Great are the works of the Lord. They are studied by all who delight in in them. 
as you study creation, you see the incredible design of God, and it is a cause for praise. <clears throat> this is not in my notes. This is always risky. But I've been reading a book um, called The Anxious Generation. It's a follow-up to The Coddling of the American Mind. Or Coddling of the American Mind? I think, yes, that's what it is. And, um, and one reason I, I'm reading it is because I hear young people talk about their anxiety all the time. I'm so anxious. I got all these problems with my anxiety, man. And I just want to let you guys know, like, we never talked about that when we were kids. I never heard that in a million years. And then when we get together for counseling, everyone's got like a therapeutic language, like, well, the problem is I have this complicated phrase or this, you know, like everyone has a way of defining himself in a therapeutic lens. One thing that's really interesting is that you see this explosion in anxiety and people defining themselves by their anxiety, sometimes starting in the mid 2000s, like 2010 and up. And one thing that they connect it to in that book that, that resonates, I don't know that it's true, but it resonates, is how um, once childhood was defined by play, and now it's really being defined by phones or electro electronic devices like that. And so there's like, you're just glued to it, and it's always, it's literally stimulating your, you know, like if you watch your phone before you go to bed, the blue light stimulates what's going on in the back of your brain. It's hard to, to sleep. But also, uh, it just gets your mind going everywhere. And I was thinking, I tell my kids sometimes, there was like days where we like stared at bark and like at the sky, like that cloud kind of looks like Godzilla. Like that's what we did for fun. It, was, it wasn't really fun, but there was nothing else to do, especially when, like, your best friend went on vacation or something. And you're just, like, counting the days till they get home so you can stare at bark together, right? Or something. Cut a tree down that you're not supposed to cut down. Did that a few times. But what's interesting is when you remove yourself from the, the, the physical, the analog, and the embodied and you live in a realm that's purely digital and exists right here, it, it, I think it makes you look inward, and it leads to more anxiety. And when you get out in the creation as a Christian, it's, it's relieving because you see the, like, how huge, how awesome God is. The God that makes the mountains is bigger than the mountains, right? The God that controls the, the raging seas. You ever watch those cruise ships when they go up and go down? You're like, or not the, the battle carriers. You're like, it's going to sink. And then it somehow keeps going. Like God is more powerful than those waves. When you're out there, there's something that, uh, that leads you to praise God. Great are the works of the Lord. They are studied by all who delight in them. As you study the creation, you're led to trust in God all the more. As the kids say, touch grass. In verse 7 through 12, he turns to the things below the heavens. He says, praise the Lord from the earth. This is the second call to worship, and it's to assemble a 23-member choir, or earthly choir. It includes sea creatures and fire and hail and storms, mountains, creeping things, kings and commoners, men and women, young and old. Everywhere from the top of Mount Everest to the greatest depths of the Mariana Trench. Everything from the giant blue whale to the smallest of beetles. Everyone from the most powerful emperor to the most humble widow is to praise the Lord. Why? Verse 7 is the call. Then we assemble the choir in verse 7 through 12. And now in verse 13 and 14, we have the cause or reason. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above earth and heaven. He has raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all his saints, for the people of Israel who are near to him. Praise the Lord. First, we have cause to praise God because of his sheer awesomeness. His name represents the perfection of all his character, characters or characteristics and attributes. Whatever you see in the world that's awesome, know that it is a reflection of our God, a dim one at that. As Psalm 113.4 says, the Lord is high and above the nations and his glory above the heaven. So we should praise God for his perfections. You want to improve your prayer life, 
You want to study God's attributes, study his names and what they mean. That's We open the Lord's Prayer first, addressed him as Father, but then we hallowed his name. And you do that by focusing on uh, all the wonderful things about God, his holiness, his justice, his judgment, right, his mercy, all those things. Second, he's raised up a horn for his people. His horn represents his strength, and primarily his strength as manifested in a redeemer or a savior. So it refers to his a saving of his people in the probably near context, the uh, delivering them uh, from exile and captivity in Babylon, but in the ultimate sense, through the salvation that we have in Christ. So why should everyone on earth praise him? Here's why. The eternal, immortal, invisible, and holy God has made a way for us to be in fellowship with him forever. We can be counted among his saints. Saints doesn't mean like some super-powered Christian, right, like the Roman uh, Catholics, the papists think. Uh, we can be near him. What, what it means, saints have been set apart, set apart for his purpose. They're his. They bear his name. Right? We're his sons. We're his children. We belong to him, and now we're near to him. Those who are uh, afar have now been brought near. That should cause praise. Derek Kidner connects the first and second half of this psalm in a very helpful way. He writes in verse 5, the celestial bodies are called to praise God simply by the fact of their existence, for he commanded and they were created. But in verse 13, man may praise him consciously, since he has revealed himself, for his name is exalted. Similarly, God's glory in the natural world is the reign of law, the regularity which invites us to search out his works. But among his people, his glory is redemptive love in the raising up of a horn for them, a strong deliverer. Above all, in bringing them near to him, that is the climax of the psalm as it is of the gospel. Behold, the dwelling of God is with men. He will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. Being his, belonging to him, that we can dwell with him and he with us, that is ultimately the gospel. As we walk through Genesis in a couple of weeks, you'll see that is the main purpose of Scripture. That is the main thing. How can we be with him again after the fall? Now, I have two conclusions. This is the first one. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to be the guy that just tells you. I'm not going to be the guy that says, and finally, twice. This is the first one, though. Uh, so the second most intense worship service I've ever attended, I've talked about this before, it was on December 8th, 2007, at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas, Nevada. In a former life, I played cards for a living as part of a card counting team. Uh, that's another story for another time. But when you play cards for a living, you get all sorts of special comps. And I really took advantage of them. Uh, but I've been a boxing fan my entire life. I watch it almost every Saturday. And I love defensive skilled boxers like Pernell Whitaker or Floyd Mayweather. I don't like him as a person, but I respect his skills. Um, so I got tickets to see Floyd Mayweather Jr. versus Ricky Haddon. And at the time, that was a huge fight. Mayweather was 38 and 0. Haddon was like 40 and 0. Uh, so it was gigantic. And everyone thought that Haddon was going to beat Floyd Mayweather because they know nothing about boxing. Uh, so I went to the MGM Grand uh, to see this fight with a good friend. And the thing about Haddon is that he's from Manchester. Now, I, uh, I don't follow football, soccer, but Manchester has a really big foot, uh, uh, soccer team. And uh, whenever... Haddon would travel even to the United States, he'd bring all the Manchester United crowd with him. They'd just follow him. And so the arena was full of people from the UK. It was something like, I would say, 70% UK to 30% Americans. Uh, and I remember one guy asked me if I'd ever been to England before. And I said, I think I'm there right now. I think I'm in England. Certainly feels like it. But as I said, it was a worship service. Uh, starting in one of the uh, undercard matches, the Brits started singing a lot. And they sang a song to the tune of Winter Wonderland, uh, but it was about Ricky Haddon. It's like walking in a hat in Wonderland or something. Not, not super creative. Um, that's probably why we are a great nation still a little bit, and they're not. Um, 
Anyhow, it uh, echoed through the entire arena. And right before the fight started, the main fight, I had to use the restroom. And they're all singing Hat in Wonderland. And it's just booming through the arena. So I get up and I walk through the hallway, past the concessions, into the bathroom. And there's these drunk British people singing about Ricky Haddon. And I come back out and they're still singing. Like in unison. They're singing such unison from like sitting in one of the bleachers all the way to the restroom. Behind a stall, there's a drunk guy there singing and they're in unity. And the sound was so loud, you, you felt it physically. It was like walking through uh, like a steam room, and the steam was, was praise. It was music. You could feel it in the air. It's like a cloud all around you, and the energy, energy was off the charts. I thought I'd never seen energy like this in a church before. I'd never seen men this passionate, united, in singing someone's praise. I can only think of two times that it got close to that in a church service. I once went to uh, Stand in the Gap, it's like 99, I think. I was at an event uh, held by the Promise Keepers, and I was in my teens, and I, I didn't know what the Promise Keepers were. Uh, but as we left the event, uh, which was on the mall in Washington, D.C., a million men started singing a hymn. And uh, we headed back to our cars. And so I remember we, we were, like, walking off the mall. We went down and got onto, um, like, the, the, the train that takes you back out of the city where you can find your car. And there was, like, this deep baritone voices praising God, echoing through the streets and on to the subway and then to the train itself. It was, that was actually more moving than anything else that happened at that event. Even as a young man new to the faith, I was like, this is cool. I can get behind this. Another time I uh, was at a men's retreat, like big burly men. There was no music, just hymnals. And all these guys started singing. I didn't grow up in the church. So I didn't know the great hymns. But uh, when big men sing loud and passionately, it's like easy to join them, right? They lack restraint. They just belted it out, deep voices praising God with real emotion, zeal, vigor, and passion. That is what Psalm 148 is calling you to. Zealous worship. Do you watch the Discovery Channel? As you go on vacation, as you walk out at night, look up at the star sky or the stars in the sky. As you see, uh, watch your kids take steps for the first time. As you see God's providence through all the works of creation, you're supposed to be moved to worship. This brings me to my second conclusion. I want to return to and finish where I began this sermon. There is a clear connection between deliverance and dominion. <clears throat> and it must be remembered that the rule of God is always first established in the heart of the individual. And from there, it spreads into every part of their life. And as that happens, it spreads out into every part of the world. At the center of that is the public praise of God. You see this in Colossians 3, 15 through 17. Verse 15, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. So Christ calls us out of the world, into his body, the church. Through him, we have peace with God. We are no longer his enemies, but sons, which leads to the peace of God ruling in our hearts. We know that he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world, and he will never leave us nor forsake us. This produces thankfulness. Verse 16, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Our thankfulness is then expressed in and through public worship. We are built up in the preaching and teaching of the word, but also in the singing of the word. We praise God with psalms, hymns, in spiritual songs, we sing psalms. This church, we don't believe in what's called exclusive psalmody. There's some people that believe you can only sing the psalms, but we definitely believe in inclusive psalmody. We want to include psalms in our worship often because we want you to know those portions of Scripture. 
As we sing songs, we admonish and encourage one another week after week. The public praise of God builds up the people of God. Verse 17, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. There is the church gathered, that we gather on uh, Sunday, and the church scattered. The church gathers on Sundays to praise and worship God. Then the church scatters through the week to serve God in whatever call God has given to each individual member. So Sunday is worship. Monday through Saturday is service. So there's a distinction. God has put the Sabbath aside for a particular purpose, for corporate and private worship together. Nothing strengthens our day-to-day service to God like public worship, especially the heartfelt, honest thankfulness heard in the loud, booming praises of his people. Do you want to see the praise of God spread throughout the world? Do you want to hear hallelujahs in the heavens and on the earth? Then praise God with all your heart on Sunday. Let the fragrance of Christ be spread into all the world through the rest of your week. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, how it commands us and calls us to worship you. There is no name above your name. There is no name above the name of your son who has saved us. Lord, help us in our worship service to raise your name on high. Help us to do what you made us to do, to praise you, God. We pray as we are built up in this service of worship to your name, as we make your name great, as we declare your fame to the world, even to our own selves, that you would strengthen us, Lord, that we could be faithful in our various vocations, our calls, our opportunity to spread that fragrance of your gospel. We pray that we would declare it in word, but also display it in power by our deeds. Lord, we thank you that you've plucked us out of the world. We thank you that we're not like those angels which rebelled and sought to raise themselves on high. But like your angels, we too declare your glory. And we look forward to the day when we're united with you in unending praise and worship. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen.